I'm delighted to welcome our participants and speakers to our webinar today on Greek diaspora in times of the pandemic. I'm author Anastasakis and I'm the director of CSOX and the principal investigator of the Greek diaspora project at the University of Oxford. Our project looks at the issue of the contemporary Greek diaspora has been uh, in operation for the last four years and it was born within the context of a deep economic crisis in homeland. Our research so far has focused on a number of pertinent issues, including crisis-led migration, political engagement, parties and diasporic vote, philanthropic giving, the Greeks in the UK, and mapping of diasporic organizations around the world. Today, we are faced with yet another crisis, which is global and not country-specific, not specific to Greece. And it is of a different nature. It's health, it's a pandemic. Yet, this new crisis is also expected to generate multiple secondary crises, social, political, and economic, the scale of which we are only speculating at the moment. The current crisis environment is a different type of crisis for the diasporic communities around the world because it is a crisis which hits, which hits homeland and hostland at the same time, which for the diasporas around the world raises issues of trust in the system of hostland and homeland, solidarity and assistance, forced movement from hostland to homeland, but also obstruction of movement for the national state's challenges also, such as issues of repatriation, financial support, protection of the most vulnerable, and cooperation with scientists abroad. So our, day, our webinar today discusses some of these issues by looking at the case of the Greek diaspora, and through that, discusses the uniqueness of the crisis, what are the initial responses and how have different Greek diasporic communities mobilized during the pandemic crisis? How has the pandemic influenced the lives of Greeks abroad and also impacted their perceptions of their homeland and homeland? How has Greece handled the situation in relation to its diaspora, mostly on issues of repatriation, but also in comparison with other countries where diaspora Greeks live? How will this new crisis possibly affect homeland diaspora engagement? This is a question looking into the future. So in this seminar, we're looking at these issues from a geographic perspective, and we've got our speakers from the United States, UK and Germany, as well as thematic perspective, the issues we raised above. I now hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Fotini Kaladzi. Fotini is the AG Leventis uh, uh, Fellow of um, the Greek Diaspora Project, one of the pillars of the project, and uh, she will present an introductory remarks and also the speakers. Thank you, Othon. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. And in these uh, challenging times uh, in which our lives have been transformed in many regards, diasporic issues uh, become more pertinent and in some ways more personal for those of us that belong to the diaspora. Our homeland seemed to be drifting further away as there was no possibility to visit. The model on which we organized our lives uh, was abruptly demolished. At the same time, crisis forces us to reevaluate the state of things. And uh, in this specific crisis, the digital era has allowed us to maintain or build bridges of communication and interaction and enhance our networks. In our team, we have focused on reviving and expanding our network that we have created during the past four years. In this, in this context, uh, our Greek diaspora digital map gains more importance as it serves as a digital bridge between Greece and the diaspora organizations throughout the world and among themselves especially in times of crisis, such a unique and openly accessible online tool can strengthen the ability of diaspora communities and actors to coordinate between themselves and with homeland entities. Uh, in conjunction with expanding our network and offering a tool of communication, we also wanted to encourage and nurture a dialogue focusing on the interactions between diaspora and homeland during the pandemic in Greece and beyond. In our discussions, uh, there were issues such as how policy makers perceive the scientific di diaspora, 
the vulnerable, the vulnerable groups hit by the pandemic who didn't have the, the, any choice but to return to Greece, repatriation, leadership issues, etc. Therefore, we have introduced, introduced our diaspora and pandemic blog, which contains opinion pieces focusing on different aspects of uh, this subject. It functions as a point of, uh, ex for exchanging views, anticipating challenges for the future, and as a source of ideas for new initiatives. initiatives. And of course, there are more blogs in the pipeline. Now, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Alexander Kitroev is professor of history at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. His latest book is The Greek Orthodox Church in America, A Modern History. Professor Kitroev will give us a historical perspective through a comparison of the pandemic crisis with previous global crises. Georgos Anagnostou is professor and the director of the Modern Greek program at the Ohio State University. His research interests include American ethnic studies and Greek transnational studies. He has published in various scholarly journals, including Melus, Diaspora, Ethnicities, Italian American Review, Journal of American Folklore and the Journal of Modern Greek Studies, among others. He is the author of Contours of White Ethnicity, Popular Ethnography and the Making of Usable Paths in Greek America. He is the editor of the online journal Ergon, Greek American Arts and Letters. Professor Anagnostou will speak about the responses and the perceptions of the Greek American community in terms of humanitarian issues, governance and Greek geopolitical interests. Andreas Golfinopoulos is a PhD candidate at the University of Ziegen and research fellow at the University of Cologne, Faculty of Human Sciences. He studied political science and public management at National Cappadocian University of Athens and graduated the MA program of political sciences at the University of Münster. The title of his PhD research is Germany, uh, as a magnet of highly skilled Greeks. Mr. Golfinopoulos will focus on the reaction of the Greek community in Germany, and specifically on the role of the Greek scientific medical community. Manolis Pratsinakis is the Onassis Foundation Research Fellow at the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Oxford. He was previously a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the University of Macedonia, a visiting fellow at the University of Sussex, and a lecturer at the University of Amsterdam. Manolis has studied geography and sociology and completed his PhD in 2013 in anthropology. Dr. Pratsinakis will talk about the Greeks in the UK and how the pandemic affected their perceptions of homeland and hostland. And uh, uh, with this, Othon, I, um, I will let you continue with the introduction. This webinar is attended uh, by uh, scholars in the field uh, as participants, attendees, uh, and um, listening to our excellent speakers, our expectations from it uh, is to activate a, a solid diasporic discussion on the current state of play, to raise new issues <clears throat> and revisit old in the light of the pandemic, and to talk about challenges in the future. The participants will talk for 10 minutes maximum each, and uh, there will then be a Q&A discussion uh, where you will be able to uh, to send your questions to which uh, our panelists will answer. And with that, we would like to start with um, Alex, uh, Alexandros Kitroev uh, and his more historical perspective of uh, diaspora and crisis. Online. Um, first of all, the definition of crisis, I think we should, I just should, I think we all know what we are talking about. But the ones I will be referring to are the global crises. In other words, this interesting phenomenon of a crisis that affects both the homeland and the diaspora, uh, the, the diaspora in the host society. Uh, they're not the same always. They can't be the same. A global crisis will have uh, different manifestations in different places. But nonetheless, it's a very interesting way in which we can uh, understand the relationship of the diaspora to the homeland. Uh, for me, it's the world, two world wars of the 20th century, the recent economic crisis of the early 21st century, and of course, the current pandemic 
crisis that my colleagues will uh, be addressing. The second general point is we are assuming a, um, a diasporic connection with Greece by definition. That's why we are here. That's why we are, um, we are, we are studying it. Um, it's, it's always good to remember that uh, not necessarily all the Greeks abroad function necessarily as a diaspora. Uh, it is part of the Greeks abroad who have this ongoing relationship with Greece, and those are the people that we are discussing. And the number of Greeks abroad relating to Greece is, is, a, is, a, is a figure that, that changes over time and depends on the context. During the uh, global crises, I think that number expands to its, to its uh, uh, greatest size. The third point I want to make is, and this is something that comes out of my own research, I always uh, understand the nature of a, the relationship and the extent to which the diaspora can affect and assist and help Greece really has to do with the circumstances that obtain in the host society. It's those particular conditions that determine, enable the diaspora to act and shape the way it does. Obviously, the Greece has to be open to the help as well, but, but I think it's important to understand it's the circumstances in the diaspora. Those are just three general points. A fourth point that has to do with Greek American history, and Yorgos Anagnosto will be talking in more detail about Greek American reactions. But again, when we talk about the Greek diaspora in the United States, when we talk about the Greek Americans and their relationship to Greece, we're actually talking about a number of organizations all of which have a slightly different agenda. There's not one Greek American reaction. There is a HEPA, there is the Hellenic American Leadership Council, there is the American Hellenic Institute, there is the Archdiocese, there's a number of institutions. And when we look at the uh, reactions that they have during global crises, those reactions are different. Uh, depending on the organization, its scope, its size, its, its strength. Now, to turn to the uh, just three historical examples uh, that we have of diaspora engagement with Greece during a global crisis. The first is, that I just want to briefly talk about is the 1940s. The second one is the 1970s and the aftermath of the Cyprus crisis. And 2008, 2010, the economic crisis. I think the uh, reaction of the Greek Americans towards Greece in the 1940s is a fairly well-known topic. There was an important exhibit uh, last November, October, November, here in Athens that highlighted the aid that the Greek Americans offered Greece. They uh, organized a particular organization, the Greek, uh, uh, the, um, Greek War Relief Association, which acted as an umbrella group and coordinated all the efforts. And from the 1940s till the time Greece was occupied, this organization offered millions of dollars in aid. And after Greece's occupation, it managed to offer significant relief to the population of Athens, especially on the eve and during the awful famine of the uh, winter of 1941, 1941-42, uh, the big famine that struck Athens. Uh, and the relief continued throughout the war. Uh, the, the figures exist. What, what I, and it's, I don't want to get into the details of the figures and the dollars amounts and the and the relief so much is, it strikes me that what's relevant in our discussion is, and I see this every time, every time I read a overall overview history of Greece, an overview of Greece, even Greece in the 1940s, that element, that help of 
from the diaspora is somehow sidelined. It becomes a footnote. And uh, maybe um, that, you know, one of the things we are doing here is that I think it be behooves us to insert this critical help into the general narrative of Greece in the 1940s. I, I dare say uh, that, you know, the help offered by the Greek Americans saved thousands of lives during that winter. It's a difficult thing to quantify, but, but the argument has to be made. That's the first example uh, in the 1940s, the spectacular aid given by the Greek Americans to Greece. It, it had to do with the circumstances in the United States, of course, the fact that the United States and Greece were fighting on the same side during World War II was a critical um, factor which enabled the Greeks to um, offer that help and enlist the, um, the help of Philelene Greek Americans as well. It, is, it stands for me as one of the important moments in the history of uh, diaspora Greek relations. The second example is the 1970s. I think you all know what I'm going to say. I'm referring to the Greek American, to the Greek lobby, as it was called. The efforts of the Greek American to persuade Congress to impose an arms embargo on Turkey following its invasion and occupation of Cyprus in the summer of 1974. Those efforts were successful from 1975 to 1978. Again, maybe in terms of overall policy and with the Cyprus uh, situation still unresolved, that one may discount those efforts. Nonetheless, if you go to international relations textbooks and textbooks on the formation of US foreign policy, that uh, action by the Greek lobby, the successful persuasion of Congress to impose an arms embargo on Turkey for that period of time stands as a prime example of how ethnic groups can successfully mobilize. And again, the quantification of the benefits of this is, is, is somewhat uh, uh, difficult to assess, but it was an important way in which the Greek Americans expressed their um, solidarity towards uh, towards Greece, um, and they continue. They, and their and the lobbying efforts have continued. But but 1975 to 1978, the arms embargo is, is is an outstanding example again of that engagement. It is too soon to assess my third example. I'm talking about the economic crisis of 2008, which arguably is still, is still going on. And there's still efforts by Greek American organizations to offer support uh, to Greece. Uh, again, um, we don't, I mean, researchers don't quite have enough of the figures available. Um, the crisis also struck, the, 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 the crisis started in the United States as well, but they were significant examples of help uh, I would uh, point to the Archdiocese and its uh, philanthropic initiatives, uh, but other organizations, Greek-American organizations as well, rallied to Greece's support to offer relief to the, uh, to the population, uh, uh, the people of Greece who were suffering through the economic uh, uh, consequences of the crisis. Uh, again, this was m more of a diffuse effort, uh, which is an interesting thing to, to reflect on. You know, with World War II, everyone bunched under the Greek War Relief Association. During the economic crisis, I think because of the proliferation of Amer Greek American institutions, there was more of a scattershot approach to that um, uh, help towards Greece. But that is, again, for me, uh, another issue, the third example with which I want to conclude with. We have, in other words, on the eve of the crisis, three historical examples which we can, I think we can, when we, I, and hopefully I think it can come out in the conversation, when we talk about the relationship of the diaspora to Greece during the pandemic, that these three experiences, in a sense, 
help us understand that the relationship is ongoing and is expressed and is amplified uh, during a crisis. So that's the, that's the rich historical background. And over to my colleagues now to talk to about the particular circumstances of the current pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alex. And that was a terrific start with a historical perspective. And um, I, I note how interesting those three uh, kind of critical junctures that you mentioned in how they kind of affected the relationship between homeland and the diaspora and how we are all found now in a, in a similar kind of critical juncture, a breakthrough moment again. Then we can move to um, Andreas, uh, who's in Germany, and will give us that kind of perspective. Andreas, the floor is yours. 10 minutes, please respect that, because we need to have questions and comments from our attendees as well. Thank you. I would rather. I will so, remind you anyway. Thank you very much for the invitation again. It's uh, my pleasure to be uh, to attend uh, this webinar. And I hope we will have an uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking discussion. So as you already know, of course, the Greek diaspora in Germany is the largest one in Europe, according to the uh, German Statistic Authority in 2019. Um, there were living in Germany over than 360,000 uh, Greeks. Uh, its, rate, uh, its rate has increased during the financial crisis, uh, the years of the financial crisis. And for its duration, Germany was the main destination of this um, of the Greek immigrants during uh, the financial crisis. Uh, the center of the uh, Greek diaspora in Germany is uh, the federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia, where I live, with over than 100,000 Greeks living, living here. There are numerous uh, Greek uh, communities, uh, Greek Orthodox churches, uh, association, as you can see also in the very detailed uh, diaspora map of your project. It's very well done. And uh, the first wave, of course, uh, um, the main wave of, of Greek immigrants came into Germany during, in uh, 1960 after the uh, recruitment agreement between West Germany and Greece for uh, low-skilled migrants uh, in, uh, lab as labor forces, uh, known as uh, Gasabaita program. So uh, firstly, I would like to give you some general information and uh, uh, examples of the, how affect, uh, how uh, the...
examples of the how affect uh, how uh, the pandemic affect the uh, lives of um, Greek uh, of the members of the Greek diaspora in Germany. Um, concerning the issue of the flights of the uh, flight uh, connection between Germany and Greece. Uh, uh, since the 18th of May, we have again a flight connection between German airports and Athens. Before this time, the uh, Greek authorities in, German, in Germany were advising the Greek citizens to travel to Belgium, to Brussels, and from Brussels, they could take the flights to uh, Athens, not to Thessaloniki, and uh, this means that many of the Greek citizens were trapped. Uh, in uh, Germany who wanted to come back to uh, Greece, that uh, this affected especially uh, the majority of the Greek uh, living here because the majority of the, especially the generation of Kasarbaita uh, uh, originate from Northern Greece, so they could not fly directly to Thessaloniki. It was complicated to travel to um, Brussels and to Athens and then to Northern Greece. And uh, yes, uh, except of that, I have to stay, say that uh, it was obviously that uh, the Greek authorities were cooperating with Greek speaking uh, um, social workers uh, uh, employed by uh, Diakoni. Diakoni uh, is a charitable organization of uh, the Evangelic Church in Germany. And they were helping the Greek diaspora during uh, the pandemic with. Uh, offering support and medical advice and so on. Um, talking about humanitarian issues, I have to remark that uh, uh, the Association of Greek Auth uh, Authors in Germany sent help packets to isolated, uh, older isolated persons uh, of Greek origins in Germany, uh, help packets with masks and uh, medical staff. And uh, another interesting uh, uh, development is the communication of the city of Zoligan, this is a small city between um, Düsseldorf and Cologne, uh, demanding uh, uh, from the German sta uh, state to accept uh, refugees due to the hygiene situation in the refugee camps of Lesbos. So that's kind of interesting, but this was an initiative from a member, uh, from a member of the city council of this uh, city, and uh, this member is the president of the European network of elected Greeks in local authorities abroad, Mrs. Zaharaki. Uh, so I'm moving to the uh, next topic of my contribution. I want to share my presentation, just a moment. Can you see that? Okay. Um, yes, so uh, I will focus now on the physicians because as you already know, many of the uh, migrants uh, during the financial crisis were highly skilled and especially uh, to German came many uh, physicians. Uh, as you can see the number of the Greek physicians from 2007 to nowadays has been always increasing especially from 2011 to 2013. Uh, the migra migration of physicians from Greece to Germany is not necessarily a result of the financial crisis, uh, as long as the number of, uh, uh, its number uh, has been increasing from uh, already before the crisis, you can see the numbers. Uh, this cannot be attributed, uh, this result can be attributed uh, to the waiting list uh, for medical specialist uh, training in Greece, which in previous years demanding from aspiring trainees uh, of some specialization waiting period from five to nine or to 10 years. And this is uh, actually a structural problem of the Greek uh, health sector uh, still, uh, not allowing uh, the graduated uh, medical uh, students to begin immediately. Uh, with their medical specialist uh, training. But due to the um, huge um, emigration of the Greek uh, physicians, uh, this waiting period uh, uh, um, has been reduced uh, in the, the last years. And other reasons have been decisive for the migration decisions, such as uh, the quality of training, 
training in the hospitals, the working conditions, and the income. So the number of uh, the Greek physicians uh, are for sure remarkable. Here you can see in this table the uh, number of the foreign physicians in the German health system. The Greeks physician are the, uh, in the third position. The first are the Romanians and the second the uh, Syrians. And uh, concerning the significant uh, presence of Greek physicians uh, in the German health sector, we uh, can take into consideration how damaging is that for the Greek state because the uh, uh, the education of a medical uh, student is the most expensive one. So we can talk about a brain drain phenomenon in this field. And focusing on the current pandemic, uh, we can plausibly think that uh, how significant uh, uh, is the absence of this trained, uh, highly skilled uh, personnel for the society in Greece. Um, we have seen, uh, uh, lastly, um, some efforts from the Greek uh, government to employ new uh, medical personnel. Uh, however, um, these uh, attempts were with uh, fixed term contracts in order to uh, cover, of course, the shortage of the personnel in the Creek Hospital, which has been caused, of course, uh, uh, as a result of the austerity measures during the financial crisis. Very alarming seems to be the situation in the health services on the islands, uh, which uh, are ready officially to uh, welcome also the international uh, tourists for this uh, summer season. Uh, there are on the islands there are also big uh, uh, shortages of medical staff and personnel. And, and obviously, these physicians who have migrated uh, abroad could be very useful during uh, the pandemic in Greece. But this is another of uh, aspect of uh, brain drain. However, the researchers of uh, highly skilled migration have shown that. Uh, there is also another aspect. There is an aspect of brain gain, that uh, transformation of uh, brain drain to, into a brain gain phenomenon is possible for the sending country. And uh, this is a great challenge for the Greek state to attract back the, um, the physician who have underta undertaken the uh, medical specialization to Germany. And uh, as I can show you in this uh, table, uh, some of uh, the Greek uh, physicians are coming back. So uh, the table shows the immigration of physicians from Germany in 2019. Uh, first uh, destination country is Switzerland and Austria is obviously because of the language, USA, and the fourth is Greece. We can assume that the most of them are Greeks, Greek citizens, because they don't have the German nationality, as you see. And, uh, but uh, however, this, uh, uh, tendency is reducing the last years. You can see also on this table, uh, it begins with 84 in 2013, then uh, 97, and now it is uh, in 2019 coming just 51 of them back. Um, through the return of the um, physicians, we can have a transfer of uh, the know-how that they gain in uh, the German health sector, uh, very useful also for the pandemic. Um, yes, but I wanted to say that uh, this uh, uh, transform of the know-how is not um, uh, it's not possible only through the return of the physicians, but also through the networks. And uh, yes, it is very important to uh, if the uh, physicians and the, all the highly skilled abroad uh, be organized in associations. And such an association we have here in. Uh, the no in North Rhine-Westphalia, uh, it's a medical uh, the association of uh, Greek physicians in Düsseldorf, Genesis is uh, their name, uh, founded in 2014. And yesterday have, I had a discussion with uh, the president of the association and he told me some uh, interesting uh, developments that the association has more conduct to the Greek state through the general secretary for Greeks uh, abroad. Uh, recently, they are promoting the networking uh, with uh, medical companies in Greece, networking with other uh, medical associations. And um, a very interesting development is uh, that uh, on Saturday, uh, there is a conference via internet, of course, uh, with uh, Greek uh, medical scientists all over the world. Uh, 
uh, also with the participations of, uh, of them and the participation of Mr. Chiodras, and they are going to discuss about uh, the exchange uh, knowledge and opinions about dealing uh, in COVID-19. Uh, so thank you very much, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Andreas, um, for your uh, very valuable information. In, in, indeed, the medical scientific community is uh, really relevant at the discussion that we're having and how Greek doctors have um, uh, engaged with the medical developments during the pandemic in Germany, but also vice versa uh, on scientific operations. And last but not least, uh, our very own Manolis uh, Pratsinakis, uh, who is the uh, deputy coordinator of our project, the Aspera project, and who is going to focus from Greece on the Greeks in the UK. Manoli, over to you. Thank you very much, Hassan. Thank you, Fotini, for the invitation. And I would like to thank all the esteemed speakers for the very valuable input. So my uh, short intervention, uh, I would like to share with you some initial thoughts on how the pandemic may influence feelings of belongingness of diasporans. And I will uh, mostly focus on newer substrata of the Greek diaspora, uh, the people who uh, emigrated in recent years, um, largely due to the crisis, the financial crisis in Greece. And I will also limit my attention on the UK, as uh, often mentioned. And which for a number of reasons, I think, um, I believe makes a very interesting case. Um, not the least because it has figured very prominently in uh, Greek media uh, in relation to repatriation from the UK and uh, the risks uh, that relate to that. And of course, um, uh, this coverage somehow um, related to the rather poor handling of the pandemic in, in, in the UK. So for instance, there were a couple of mentions that attracted attention uh, in media that concerned uh, people who had returned uh, in uh, Greece and had broken their from the UK and had broken the quarantine, who would then uh, were found to be uh, um, having the virus and then risks thus risked uh, spreading it into Greece. And much more uh, extensive was the um, uh, attention that was paid on the high number of people that attempted to return from the UK. Uh, during March, um, and uh, also the fact that uh, some of them uh, filed um, claims for the supposed repatriation program that was announced early on, and then, of course, we had the phenomenon of uh, several people being stranded um, um, in uh, various airports in, in London in their attempt to, to, to leave the country. So. Um, Different types of crises, uh, be they political, economic, environmental, uh, have a very significant impact in um, the formation of diasporas. In, firstly, in the very obvious reason that they often lead to emigration, which is evidently, dispersion itself is evidently the, the, the most um, uh, essential element uh, in the formation of diasporic communities. But at the same time, critical events are very important um, in mobilizing existing diasporas or forming others as such, given that they provide, so to say, an impetus uh, to engage uh, with uh, what may be their homeland, in case it is them who have migrated, or with their country of origin, in case it was their forebears that had migrated before them. And indeed, uh, Alex has provided us with uh, several very interesting historical examples that showcase how you know, we do not treat diaspora as a countable entity with, you know, a, a very concrete number of people that uh, comprise it, but rather a kind of relationship that intensifies uh, or lessens uh, given um, uh, different circumstances. Uh, and the pandemic, uh, as it was noted previously, it's a very um, interesting such an event because it's a global crisis in a way. Uh, it does not only concern one of the countries concerned, but they, it concerns both at the same time and um, equally. It's this over-encompassing character of the pandemic then that uh, makes people to um, reassess, let's say, their social ties, their cultural affinities, um, their prospects of economic well-being. And in that context, um, 
many questions, let's say, are raised, especially for more recently uh, settled communities that are much more organically, one may argue, uh, um, embedded uh, with uh, homeland. Uh, for instance, uh, and there is a comparative aspect uh, in those questions framed uh, in a, between the country of settlement and the country of origin. For instance, how institutions uh, in the countries concerned dealt with the pandemic, how the societies themselves uh, reacted and managed the, the, the crisis, where one feels safest, uh, where one feels more protected and health-wise, that's one thing, but also in terms of one's socioeconomic well-being in view of the economic depression we are told to be expecting to come. Uh, other question that is raised is to which society, and that's very interesting, I think, one feels more responsible, responsible to and how is responsibility assessed and perceived uh, in the context of a, a pandemic? Does it mean being present and providing help or does it mean maybe self-excluding oneself from a society uh, in order to, to protect it? Um, so those are obviously complex questions and I won't be able to provide a comprehensive, uh, uh, let's say, image of how they are answered by different uh, uh, Greek, different you know, uh, communities of Greeks in the UK. But I'll try to highlight a few instances that showcase how those questions somehow emerge. Um, and we are planning, in fact, to run a follow-up survey to the one that we conducted among the Greek diaspora in the UK, uh, in which we will tackle those questions, but that's something for the future. Now I will um, base myself on a kind of a preliminary analysis that I did on uh, social media, notably Facebook groups, uh, during March. March was an important month. It was the month when the spread of the virus was um, announced uh, by the World Health Organization as a pandemic uh, and it was the month where progressively lockdown measures were enforced initially in Greece and later on in, in the UK too. Um, so uh, the UK attracted this attention uh, I think for a number of reasons. Uh, as I mentioned firstly it was the rather poor handling of the pandemic um, especially if we compare that to Greece in the first phase. We do not know how things will evolve in the future, but in the current phase, it seems that the Greek, uh, let's say, institutions, political system, and most importantly, people somehow um, managed to contain the spread of, of the virus. Uh, a second thing has to do with the socio-demographic characteristic of the um, Greek diaspora in the UK. As we know, the UK has traditionally hosted a small segment of the global Greek diaspora. But over the past few years, um, the Greek population in this country uh, grew exponentially. Uh, it became a major destination for the new Greek migration, second only to Germany. And in relative terms, one may argue it was the most uh, dynamic destination, with numbers increasing uh, uh, through time. Uh, we, of course, the Brexit may change this dynamic, but up to now, uh, this seems to be the, uh, the trajectory. And this has uh, currently, let's say, we may estimate the population from 80,000 to 100,000 people, and the majority of them, around 70%, are new migrants. And of course, that has ramifications in terms of like the embeddedness in the UK society and their demographic makeup. We are speaking mostly of younger people. Uh, and we are speaking also of a population that includes an important number of students. Um, the UK has traditionally been uh, the, the major uh, destination of student migration from Greece. Currently, almost 10 to 15 percent of uh, the total uh, population in the country, Greek population in the country, uh, concerns students. Um, and it is also the deregulated uh, labor market in the UK that has played a role. It's dynamic, it's open, yes, but it is also not um, providing sufficient support in such times. Uh, for instance, in our uh, research, we have found out that 13%, uh, 1, 3, 13% of the total Greek population in the UK is on zero hour contracts, and an additional 14% uh, are on temporary contracts. And those people during the pandemic were found in a very insecure uh, situation. Um, now, 
by analyzing like uh, the, the reaction of people as it was um, um, represented in social media uh, in March, I kind of um, discerned three different phases. In the first phase, there was one may say general outcry against what was seen as a complacent attitude by the UK government. Uh, and the surprise that Greece seemed to be more alert in dealing with the pandemic and the frustration that was expressed uh, came to be added uh, to a previous dissatisfaction with Brexit and also its handling by the current government and Boris Johnson in, in particular who kind of personified all, all those crises. The reaction was uh, rather univocally negative about the UK and the UK government and it was rather mixed towards Greece. So there were people who were like positive but others that were a bit more reserved to um, give the credit to Greece. The second phase, uh, which started uh, when people started leaving in large numbers from the UK and when um, the problems, uh, when the um, borders closed and people started getting stranded uh, in, in airports, was a much more uh, complicated one. And um, the reaction and the discussions around that time focused on the choice of those people who decided to leave the UK. And in what uh, Robin Ho Cohen has recently termed uh, a mobility that may uh, um, uh, named as panic mobility. He used this term to describe a phenomenon uh, in which humans act, let's say, somehow, somehow unwittingly as bearers of viruses by moving rapidly and in large numbers uh, from sites of infection. Uh, um, and as destination, obviously, uh, they move somewhere where it's familiar uh, to home in most cases. Interestingly enough, um, there was a division in views and there were like quite heating, heated debates. Uh, there were many who criticized those who were returning to Greece. We know that migration in recent years to a large extent was aimed in getting independence from constraints in Greek society, from frustrations with economic situations in Greece. And they were accused like from kind of um, leaving unfinished a project that they had started and you know, being cowards more, more or less. And interestingly, this um, critique came from, from two different starting points. On the one hand, it was those who claimed that um, by returning to Greece, they're risking uh, spreading the virus in Greece, where is a country, which is a country uh, that has a weaker uh, health system and that it is an irresponsible uh, practice in itself, and especially towards homeland. And there was the others who, uh, thank you, Adam. Um, and there were the others who criticized such uh, moves um, in practical terms. Uh, not because of their potential ramifications, but because uh, they were criticizing the choice itself. And they were thinking that this is not a smart move to make because uh, Greece uh, will not fare uh, well in the longer run, will face big problems, big economic problems, and um, that this is simply not a smart move to, to be made to return. Obviously, they were the supporters of people who rightfully uh, highlighted that you have uh, people who were found in a very insecure situation. They lacked the means to support themselves in the UK. They had to leave. Others needed to leave you know, because they, uh, they have family members who needed their support in Greece. And the student population, um, students in many universities in the UK were explicitly uh, urged to leave the country, uh, not to get blocked there. Um, and in the first, in the third uh, phase, um, when the smoke uh, had gone down, so to say, in a way, we saw uh, something that uh, Andreas also kind of pointed to uh, from the, uh, the German case. Um, we usually speak of how the diaspora helps the homeland during the crisis or vice versa, how the uh, homeland can be of help to uh, and support um, diaspora, diaspora communities abroad, but there is a very uh, important dimension of the diaspora helping um, itself, so to say, and uh, the solidarity actions that are developed in such uh, uh, times. So one could see um, a lot of efforts uh, which were 
often coordinated through such social media uh, to um, uh, help uh, people in need in, um, in the UK uh, who were found in difficult situations. And with that, uh, I will finish. Thank you. I'm sorry, Manoli, for being a nerd, but um, we have to have our discussion. Thank you very much because you did uh, raise uh, uh, this uh, other perspective of, uh, you know, what kind of um, uh, feelings and identity issues, uh, you know, these um, really abrupt times have, uh, have caused. And I also need to say here that um, Manolis has been in charge of um, a uh, survey that we did on the Greeks in the UK, which is done in cooperation with the analysis. And uh, as we are updating a bit our information, we have already finished with the survey, but we do update it with the pandemic. And then uh, together with the analysis, we will be publicizing this uh, in Greece and globally. Now let's move uh, quickly to the questions. And um, uh, there are already some, and thank you very much for them. And I would like to ask uh, the question that Adrienne Chasty has um, uh, from uh, Oxford with us uh, has put to us because she does um, say that Greece has been praised for handling the pandemic relatively well. And it may be too soon to judge, of course, but do you perceive any change in the relationship between the diaspora and homeland in line to Greece's relatively good performance? I think that's a very important question because it does have repercussions as to how the diasporic populations view um, the, uh, 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 you know, the homeland in terms of addressing that. Um, this is one question that I would like to put to Yorgos Anagnostou, uh, since he has also dealt with uh, the issue of, uh, um, uh, you know, the image of Greece during the crisis. But there is also another question for Alex uh, uh, Kitroev uh, regarding uh, the issue of uh, the Greek church. Uh, this is uh, the question that comes from Fevronia Sumaki, and uh, she is actually asking, given the important role of the church, and you, I think, uh, uh, Alex, you also have the question in front of you, uh, given your extensive work on Greek the Orthodox Church in the U.S. and the convergence of the two crises, health pandemic and civil rights protests, how would you characterize the church's response to this current crisis, and how would you compare um, with the church's response in the past? So let's start with Yorgos, uh, but please be brief because we're going to have more questions. Let's start with Yorgos on this issue of uh, Greece's great performance. Uh, this is an important question. Thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to place it in the broader context of Greece's international image and how this image was met and detected in the crisis. We know the negative coverage that Greeks, uh, Greek people received in the European press and less so in the American press. And Greek Americans have been extremely active to, uh, in many ways, counter this uh, negative image. And there is, um, I have just finished uh, an article on how there has been concerted effort, efforts to brand the Greek image as a positive image within the global hierarchies of culture, right? Greeks have been portrayed as lazy, as incompetent, as uh, non-effective. And in many ways then there is a very strong Greek-American response. The, in response to the specific question you raised, my evidence comes from two sources, social media. In social media, we see now people being, feeling emboldened to a, a challenge the hierarchy, the usual hierarchy, the US is great, Greece is the poor relative, so to speak. And here we have a, 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 a reversal. Uh, Greek Americans choose to go to Greece to, in many ways, weather the pandemic rather than staying here, some of them, though they can afford it. Nevertheless, there is a changing dynamic on these hierarchies, on, on national hierarchies. And the second source of evidence that I have is various lobbying organizations like the Hellenic American Leaders Council, who incessantly promote the good news about um, the effective Greek response to the virus. And that adds to this ethnic pride 
in many ways, the reversal of the hierarchies. Though I should say that the comparison between Greece and the United States in the, res the respective responses to the pandemic are very rudimentary and simplified because in many ways you cannot compare the two countries. One is a major global hub where travel is um, uh, common during March. Uh, Business-related uh, business travel is extremely common. While Greece is not as intense in these terms. Of course, Greece, without uh, any doubt, took measures much earlier and it was in many ways effective in containing. Thank you uh, very much, Yorgo. And uh, Alex, could you answer the question on the church, please? Uh, yes, that is also a very good question because I think we are witnessing the a renaissance of Greek Orthodoxy in America and the role of the church. Initially, because of the crisis, uh, the church had to tend to the, uh, to the internal solidarity, as Manoli said. It had to cater to its, to its own needs. There were huge issues of whether the churches would stay open, uh, the liturgical aspects, uh, communion, a whole set of uh, issues that the church had to address immediately uh, during the crisis. And uh, Archbishop Elpidophoros gave a very, uh, let, let, me, let me call it a very modernist approach, uh, speaking openly about the primacy of science and saying what is threatened is not our faith, but lives. We've got to believe the scientists. There was a, an op-ed piece, I think it was on Saturday in the NEA in Athens by the sociologist Professor Nikos Muzelis, who was saying, why doesn't the Greek, why can't the Greek church do as the American, as the Greek Orthodox Church in America was doing? It gives you the measure of the leadership role that the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese is playing. Likewise, the Archbishop, uh, and this got a lot of coverage, um, participated in one of the marches associated with the George, George Floyd campaign, um, participated in that march in Brooklyn. And again, that was a very clear message of where the church is standing. Um, a lot of people went back and made the comparison with Archbishop Iakovos, who marched with Martin Luther King in Selma, Alabama in 1965. He was about the only prelate in the Greek Orthodox Church who was actually standing on the side of Martin Luther King, literally and metaphorically. This time, I think the church and Archbishop Elpidophoros has got a lot of support as he's come into the position. It, he's just been, it's just been a year since he was appointed. Uh, he's also given the tone and pointed the church towards uh, shown Greek Orthodox people that the right thing to do is to stand on the side of the anti-racist movement. So these two examples uh, are really a sign of uh, the church assuming responsibility and playing a leadership role in Greek American affairs. And, you know, it's very impressive. And uh, I think we're almost waiting. What next with Archbishop Elpidophoros? Um, thank you very much, Alex. Now, um, I will combine two questions for um, uh, Andreas and Manolis here. Uh, there is a question that comes from uh, Julie Adams, uh, our CISUX administrator, and um, she wants to know how many Greeks have died from COVID-19 in the UK, US, and Germany. Now, I can respond to this question and expand on this. In Greece, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it's um, below 200. So that's a very, very low number. In the UK, uh, we know that it's 42,000 almost, um, but then there are 60,000 more deaths than the years before. Uh, so the number is definitely over um, uh, 42 uh, and above 1,000. The United States has surpassed the, the 100,000. Um, uh, I don't know the exact number. And Germany, uh, is something that I would leave with Andreas together with a question as to what is the perception there on how Germany 
uh, why has so effectively addressed the issue uh, of the pandemic. And to um, Manolis, I would like to ask the question that uh, Charles Enoch is putting, um, and um, uh, to tell us a little bit about the doctors in the UK. What kind of information do we have from a survey regarding doctors in the UK? Um, and uh, Charles is also asking whether we can answer, of course, are Greeks involved in the NHS or care sector in the UK? And have they shared in the widespread UK support for foreign workers in this context? Obviously, within your own knowledge, Manolis, and, and, and the survey that you have uh, uh, conducted as well. Uh, Andreas, over to you first. Yes. Well, uh, um, unfortunately, I don't have uh, any information about how many Greek died in Germany uh, from uh, COVID-19. Uh, I can say though that uh, the German media uh, were impressed from uh, the Greek uh, policy uh, concerning uh, measures against uh, COVID-19. And uh, really the we have a same situation if we compare Greece and Germany because uh, we have good policies. Uh, the media co were uh, commenting positively both uh, countries. And it is believed that uh, the good uh, uh, at efforts in uh, the German health sector has, uh, is relevant with the structures of the German health sector because uh, the patients don't go directly to the hospitals, as we have seen in Italy, but uh, to the first uh, health services, we are getting advice, and uh, so there are no um, gathering in hospitals in order to spread the COVID-19. Um, thank you, Andrea. I did misread the Julie's question in that she was asking how many Greeks died in these countries. Of course, uh, you know, she, she knows the numbers that I told her already. I don't know whether we've got this information. Um, if we've got it in the United States, when we come back later, uh, we can have uh, an answer to this. Manoli, uh, tell us about uh, doctors in the UK. Yes, uh, the UK is also a major destination to, um, for the migration of doctors, uh, it has been uh, before the crisis. And of course, this trend um, intensified uh, quite a lot during the recent years. And yes, many of them are working in NHS. Um, according to our survey uh, from the graduates, uh, uh, from the people who have tertiary level education uh, of Greek origin that are in the UK, six to seven percent are um, have studied health um, so uh, it can be also a, you know, quantitatively speaking um, considerable uh, number of people and uh, then i uh, would uh, also assume that then they also take uh, the credit um, as part of the widespread let's say support that foreign workers uh, are getting uh, in the uk for their support to to nhs um, I don't have any concrete information about that, but what I wanted to highlight in relation to this is possibly the fact that exactly because of the character of the Greek migration to the UK, uh, which has been traditionally more uh, of a highly skilled type of migration, and this continued during the years of the crisis, um, the image of the Greek migrant in the UK has been, generally speaking, uh, rather favorable. Um, so this could only have come to um, strengthen the, these views, but I think this kind of support that uh, other migrant groups have gotten during this period may have come as more important from, from other uh, nationalities, such as the Eastern Europeans, who have attracted um, and uh, for no right reasons a lot of negative uh, um, views. Uh, so for them, I, I think it was very helpful for, for the public to realize the very real contributions in, in, in the system. And just if I may uh, add a very uh, quick comment on the first question, uh, which is about how um, um, somehow the, the degree to which the pandemic changes the views of the diasporans in the UK in that particular instance for Greece. And I would say that as Jorgo said, I, I also uh, noted that uh, when I analyzed uh, social media, that there was um, a need to, to let's challenge the Western-centric Western -centric narcissism that 
you know, here in the UK or here in the US, we are always doing it better and it was an opportunity for them to, to, uh, to claim that for once, let's say, Greece did better. But at the same time, I would like to be cautious uh, in having, in thinking that such kind of um, more favorable views about Greece would translate necessarily for a higher trust towards Greece and Greece institutions, and that could even potentially lead to increased return. Um, because equally importantly, uh, from uh, the, the posts in the social media, I've seen that there was still a lot of mistrust about Greece and whether this is an isolated case that relates possibly also to the fact that health uh, in Greek culture is, is uh, attributed a very significant uh, position, anthropologically speaking, and maybe that played a role, but again, you know, in the future other problems uh, may come. So it was a kind of a mixed bag uh, reaction. Um, thank you, Manoli. Now, um, we've got a question from uh, Caterina Lagos, who's um, at attending this from Sacramento, so it's great. Uh, hi, Caterina. But we also have um, a, uh, one or two colleagues from Australia as well, where time there is around one or two o'clock. This is one reason why we couldn't have a speaker from Australia. So, Caterina has a question for Yorgos and uh, a question for Alex. For Yorgos, uh, she says that, um, uh, that he's highlighted that the white supremacist support for Trump, uh, is, is this a higher percentage than what was expressed for prior presidents? Is this support an anomaly or part of a larger trend in the political party? And the question for Alex is to what extent was El Pidoforos that you already mentioned, El Pidoforos' response in coordination with the patriarchate, uh, where the various RCDOCs uh, coordinated, or do you find that there were different in responses. I mean, that Orthodox, Greek Orthodox uh, perception is really, really important on how they vary from country to country. So Yorgo, can you start and then Alex will take from you. Can you unmute? Uh, yes. Yes, thanks, Katerina. Yeah, this is a question. I have not done uh, research on this topic, so I will not be authoritative, but I will be tentative based on my general following these issues. Uh, historically speaking, I mean, starting with Reagan, uh, there has been the accusation that the Republican Party links to the white nationalists to, to, of course, court their vote. And because they cannot do it explicitly, uh, they do it with uh, what political analysts speak about racial coding. They will make references where these groups will recognize as friendly references. What we saw, and here I have it in front of me, and I, I read this in preparation for this uh, presentation, uh, an, an incredible um, article analysis by Politico. The title is White Nationalists Turned to Love Trump. And the main idea here is that white nationalists were extremely suspicious of Trump they did not believe that he would be extending any kind of uh, help or alliance, political alliance to them. But what we have with the Trump situation is that the administration was, what, rather his, his, his uh, campaign was sending increasingly uh, messages to these groups. Uh, these uh, analysts call them wink, wink messages. Uh, uh, communicating to them that he is with them and he is in many ways, he will be supporting some of their agendas. And during his, uh, and of course it was um, the uh, David Duke from Louisiana that first embraced him, the white nationalists started to be convinced. Uh, they were listening about Trump's position on immigration when there was this face-to-face -face confrontation between and the white nationalists, and one protester was um, killed by a car where Trump explicitly said, oh, there were two guys confronting each other. He, here we have then a situation where the Trump um, uh, 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 group is uh, sending uh, messages that in many ways later on during his presidency, they were translated into policy, his very tough policy on um, uh, Hispanic immigration and also Muslim immigration. So in many ways, then there was both uh, uh, comments, words, 
racial coding and political decisions that in many ways convinced the white nationalists to back him up. Thank you, Giorgo. And um, Alex, uh, there's a question uh, regarding church, but also one more question because also we are nearing our time that come from our colleague uh, Andonis Camaras, uh, one of the other pillars of our uh, project here. And he says here, I'm just reading it because I didn't have time to read it by myself, are Greek historians, by ignoring the diaspora historical impact on the homeland, negatively affecting the ability of Greek decision makers and the Greek public to grasp the actualities and potentialities of the contemporary interaction between the diaspora and the homeland um, in crisis conditions. Uh, and uh, there's a question for Andreas and I will ask later. Over to you, Alex. Yes, good, thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Yes, of course, uh, I think uh, Archbishop Elpidophoros is in sync with the ecumenical patriarchate. I think his appointment last year uh, signals an alignment with the largest Greek American community abroad, Greek, uh, largest Greek Orthodox Church abroad with the ecumenical patriarchate. And I think very much the two uh, um, are proceeding in sync. And I think uh, very much uh, uh, ecumenical patriarchs Bartholomeus's view on what should happen uh, was uh, was echoed by Elpidophoros. I think Elpidophoros has been given, though, has has necessarily is is adapting the policies into the to, to the very particular American uh, environment, because I think he's he was I think he was very well aware of the reactions that some metropolitans may have had to what he was talking about science prevailing. Therefore, I think, uh, I, I think they're in sync. And I think Archbishop Elpidophoros is also taking the initiative to adapt the, this message and this policy into the very complicated American environment. Um, as to uh, Adonis's question, um, you know, uh, I mean, yes, but to give you an example, there's there's a there's a they're planning a conference on the bicentennial of the uh, Greek Revolution of 1821 next year in Greece, and I think the organizers, because they understand the Greek Revolution as something that has an international implications, they uh, they want to include papers about the diaspora and its impact in other countries. So yes, I think his, historians generally tend to ignore the Greek diaspora and that doesn't help in terms of policy because the policy makers don't have an, an, an easy ready message in their minds about the, the significance of the diaspora. On the other hand, I'm not pessimistic because I think Greek historians, if they're invited to think more carefully and clearly about Greece's international position and the role of the diaspora, they will not, uh, in a sense, um, refuse or reject the proposition that the diaspora is important. It's just that the diaspora gets forgotten at times and plays this secondary role. And, uh, you know, we've got to, it's us, we have to push it forward and remind them of its significance. Um, thank you, Alex. And uh, we've got uh, one minute, but there are uh, three uh, remaining questions, and I would like to put them to the uh, panelists before we um, uh, before we leave. Uh, there is uh, one question that comes from Rene Hershon, and she's talking about the refugee crisis. So we haven't mentioned that enough, but it's a very topical and important matter right now. And she would like to ask speakers uh, whether they would like to comment on whether there is growing xenophobia in Greece on the refugee matter, and maybe in other host countries where Greek diaspora exists. Now, I don't know who would like to take that, but I'm putting this as a question, um, and Andreas would like to take that. Then there is um, one more question for Andreas from Andonis, which says about um, uh, Greek clinicians in Germany. And the question is whether they have been passing on their coronavirus-related 
concrete clinical protocols to colleagues in Greece through informal channels prior to the Greek government initiatives that uh, were mentioned. Um, and uh, there is uh, one question um, uh, that was asked by David Madden, and maybe I can ask Manolis in the end to answer this. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, it's about whether uh, COVID-19 you know, has complicated the lives of the Greek, um, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated lives of diaspora, uh, of diaspora, diaspora Greeks, and how do you see, you know, them being affected by this? Can we make any kind of prediction in terms of, uh, of this? Um, so over to you uh, uh, for this uh, particular final questions. Uh, and, uh, oh, there is one more, if one cares to address that, and that is the second one from Adrian Chesty, who's asking whether there's any evidence yet of a decline in remittances to Greece in light of the global downturn. So these are the final questions, and please, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's start with Andreas. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, concerning the question of Mr. Camaras, I uh, cannot uh, answer it because I guess that there, there, is, there are, of course, informal channels. Every um, uh, physician and uh, Greek physician in Germany is in contact with uh, their colleagues in Greece. So I guess they exchange opinions about uh, uh, these issues. And uh, concerning the question of uh, Mrs. Hirschhorn, um, well, it's not scientific what I'm going to say, but I, I have, I think that uh, the xenophobia in Greece uh, really is growing, especially uh, on the borders. Uh, we have seen a couple of months before what, uh, uh, what uh, was going on there with uh, with uh, militias of uh, citizens in Evros and so on. So I will say also in Lesbos we have some strange reactions of the uh, citizens there against uh, refugees as well, uh, also against the uh, police. But anyway, I will say that uh, the xenophobia is growing in Greece. And uh, concerning the um, Greek diaspora in Germany, uh, I will say, um, they are not just sensible for these issues um, because they, 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 there were some attempts also, I mentioned, I mentioned also uh, this announcement from the city of Zoligan made by uh, Mrs. Zaharaki too, but uh, uh, this was not uh, uh, supported from a part of the Greek diaspora uh, at all. Um, I can um inform you that uh, this time there were some uh, demonstrations also during the uh, measures uh, with the coronavirus and anti coronavirus um, some demonstration uh, against the hygiene uh, situation in the refugee camps uh, made by uh, german activist groups of course uh, like the Die Brücke, the bridge you can uh, translated like that. And uh, there were some reactions for uh, demanding to the German state to accept more refugees from Greece uh, to Germany. And I remember the last uh, visit of uh, Mr. Mitsotaki, uh, Mitsotaki. <laughs> uh, of the Prime Minister of uh, Greece in Berlin. Um, were organized also some demonstration against uh, the uh, living situation in uh, uh, refugee camps in uh, on Lesbos, uh, with the participation also from a small part of the Greek diaspora. Does that? Thank you, Andreas. Um, uh, any um, any uh, comment on the remittances that was um, uh, that was raised? Uh, maybe from the United States? No. Uh, Manoli, would you like to say, you know, one final comment as to whether you believe that, uh, you know, things will change irrevocably or how dramatic this is going to be as, a, as this breakthrough moment, the pandemic for diaspora? Um, yes. Um, well, obviously, I think it's, it's, uh, it is an, an important moment that makes many people who are endorsing living a transnational lifestyle, so to say, to reconsider potentially their, their, their choice because the obstruction to mobility poses huge problems uh, to people who are 
um, sharing their life there and here. So that's one thing uh, in one way or another. Um, and then there is, of course, uh, speaking of Greeks in particular, uh, who have fled Greece in recent years because of a very severe economic crisis in, uh, in, in that country and uh, were finding uh, the, the existence of opportunities in other countries that will make it very difficult for them because they, you know, they are frustrated to be once more in a very difficult situation because of um, the economic crisis that is already uh, present and will most probably intensify in the next period. So um, I can't speculate and I don't know how lasting those effects will be and what will be uh, their, um, uh, their consequence in terms of the decisions that will, people will make um, with their life choices, but certainly it has been a huge blow, uh, especially for the vulnerable people. And a very short comment on the question of um, uh, René uh, about refugees. Uh, I think that initially there was an unfortunate attempt to scapegoat uh, refugees as bearers of the virus who would spread it in the country by the government, uh, which of course uh, were not found to be the case, uh, which somehow uh, showcases um, how the refugees are viewed in Greece. And I think that indeed uh, xenophobia is rising. And also, uh, even though uh, there should be given credit to the government on the handling of the pandemic, uh, and we were lucky not to have incidents in the refugee camps, uh, but um, the handling within those camps were not equally uh, good. Um, the general um, uh, advice was to stay at home so as not so as to be able to keep social distance whereas in those camps people were just um, put together without the ability to keep uh, those uh, uh, regulations and they were kind of um, represented as unfortunately represented as hygiene uh, bombs um, yes yeah, so that would be my reaction and about remittances um, we know that during the crisis, over the last 10 years, we have seen a reduction uh, of uh, remittances being sent to Greece, which is a bit uh, counterintuitive because what we know from literature is when you have um, such um, events, um, the, the diaspora tends to mobilize also in terms of sending uh, money. Um, I don't have any information of, of whether this has changed and in what way during the pandemic. Uh, that's something to, to, to be explored i think um thank you very much for um, answering all the questions uh, that the attendees put to you um from my part before i hand over to fortini to have the final word i would like to uh thank our speakers uh really you know profoundly because that has been a terrific discussion the um the spread of the themes that we addressed was uh, really inspiring uh, and it gives us also us ideas that we are dealing with the Greek diaspora project to move on but also it's been terrific to see you and to have your input uh, thank you very much i'm sorry we cannot have a drinks reception after that um, i guess from now on we'll have to combine our online exchanges together with um, your physical presence in oxford when time allows i will give the floor for the need to finish this but thank you very much from my part and also thank you to all those who attended um, this uh, uh, great uh, panel discussion today. Fotini. Thank you very much for uh, all your valuable presentations and of course for all the questions posed that uh, facilitated this dialogue. I just want to say uh, a last thing that uh, we, we have as a goal to build on this network and uh, of course have more global discussion and uh, ironically it seems like the pandemic is an opportunity to connect more often. Um, thank you very, very much all for, for your attention and uh, for the valuable conversation we had. Keep safe. Bye everyone. <laughs>